Well, boys and girls, it seems I've been pwned. A month or so ago, Potholer54 made a video in which he addresses some of the mistakes he has made in his video series on evolutionary science made easy. It was the third such video he has made, and I commented then that it was time that I made one too. I've been wanting to for a few months, ever since it had been pointed out that one of my videos contained more than just a trivial mistake, but where I made a claim that was actually false. Each of my videos has been criticized, of course, some of them justified. For example, the second foundational falsehood of creationism has two Bible citations that are both typos and don't lead to the correct passages. In the fifth FFOC, I had James Monroe listed as the fourth U.S. president when he was actually the fifth, and in the twelfth episode I copied lines of Aramaic backwards. For a long time, my most embarrassing mistakes were in spelling, like flashing the word unanimous in the fifth FFOC. Once I tried to correct my spelling and only made it worse, I meant to label a dromedary and a bactrian camel, but I couldn't remember how to spell bactrian, so I went to check it, got interrupted, sent on an errand, and came back an hour or so later and forgot what I was doing. And so when I posted the video, I saw that there was a camel labeled as bacteria. The tenth FFOC contains an omission of my own ignorance. I had said that vertebrates had red blood and mollusks had blue blood and that there were no exceptions on either side. By this I meant that an evolutionary lineage determines who inherits hemoglobin versus hemocyanin. However, commenters pointed out that there were some obscure exceptions, though none which detracted from the phylogeny indicated. One was a genus of skinks with blood superficially colored green by a buildup of bile. There was also an order of Antarctic ice fish who have replaced their hemoglobin with a sort of glycoprotein antifreeze. These have white or clear blood. Most significant was a family of mollusks in which hemocyanin ancestry was genetically there, but is hindered, forcing an alteration to something else. A study in Gutenberg University reveals a surprisingly simple evolutionary mechanism to derive a new form of hemoglobin from myoglobin. This illustrates an advantage in posting to an interactive forum as opposed to, say, publishing a book, where you wouldn't have any attached feedback and therefore might not even know if you'd made any mistakes. For example, I remember reading Carl Sagan's Cosmos, and I remember him saying that Moses had invented monotheism. Now, the scholarly consensus, I believe, is that the oldest monotheistic religions are either Zoroastrianism or the worship of Amenhotep and that Moses likely didn't even exist, as he was apparently a composite of at least four different characters of other legends. However, uh, given Sagan's extensive knowledge in other areas, and the fact that he has no particular familiarity in this area, I consider that a forgivable mistake. Likewise, I once submitted a huge series of posts to Talk.Origins, disproving every single sentence out of one chapter of Dr. Job Martin's book, Evolution of a Creationist. He likely will never know those posts even exist, and wouldn't acknowledge his mistakes there even if he did. Creationists typically don't. Those who advocate science instead typically do. I work on my videos whenever I've got a spare moment, and they're usually made amid myriad interruptions, and finding available time for uh, adequate composition is increasingly an issue. Uh, haste will lead to mistakes. In one case, I used a chart as an illustration to represent American demographics, but the chart I used actually came from New Zealand, and I didn't notice that until it was called on it. Fortunately, none of the comments I made were dependent on that chart. Everything I said there was still correct, and the chart did bear a similar trend of what we were seeing in the U.S. In another video, I chose an illustration to show the maximum development of fish by the end of the Cambrian period, but the example I chose was actually from the Silurian. I thought something was wrong with that, but hurried through and forgot to check myself. As it happens, I was able to correct it when the original video was taken down by a false DMCA. Another problem has been sources. I had to correct a lot of the sources for an archaeological moment in time, both before and after composing the script. It took a month to make that video, and I grew suspicious about one of my references. The only non-archaeological source was a televised documentary. Past experience has taught me to be a little suspicious of those. And it claimed that an isolated troop of island mammoths had survived well into the Roman era. I finally looked up the carbon dates and found that the documentary, sure enough, had overshot its claim by some 1,500 years. I had already recorded the script with a synchronized musical overlay, and it was nearly done. So I posted the piece with an annotation to correct the script. Other sources have been just as bad, like when I had to refute the media's claim that Ida was a missing link between humans and more generalized primates or more recently when I complained about the news again, this time proclaiming that the arsenic-tolerant microbe in Mono Lake was the product of its own abiogenesis event and that it wasn't related to anything else on Earth. 
Nowadays, I know better than to trust so much of what I read. But I remember around Y2K, I read an article about a handful of tetrachromatic women who claimed that they could see ultraviolet light emanating from flowers in fields at dusk. The accounts claimed they could see these flowers in the same way that bees allegedly could. I had mentioned this little tidbit of curiosity on a handful of blogs and such since then, but it never seemed to warrant much interest or conversation. The original source for it is long gone, as I discovered when Gohan321 finally called me on it about five months ago. The video had been up for a year by then. I tried to find the original sources. I tried to find the links in my old posts on Usenet. Couldn't even find them there. That's when I began to realize that I just might have naively believed what may have been no more than anecdotal testimony, and then consequently repeated complete hogwash. I absolutely hate that. My son announced to me that one of his science teachers believed that cockroaches were vertebrates. <laughs> Another science teacher told him, on the day that I released the video announcing, explaining what a science theory is, my son's science teacher coincidentally chose that day to tell the class that evolution was just a theory, not a fact. And then he went on to say that there has never been a beneficial mutation. My son, in one of the moments that I'm proud of him for, opened the textbook and said, but teacher, beneficial mutations are listed in the required <laughs> curricula right here in the textbook. And he was reprimanded by the teacher for that. I didn't want to limit myself to standard textbook examples. And when I began my series, I still trusted journalism. So I relayed exactly what respectable news agencies were reporting about various beneficial mutations among humans at that time. The 8th FFOC was built on a list I made of these stories from 2005. It was initially a quick roundup provided for a creationist who denied that such things could ever happen. Another creationist has recently posted an uncharacteristically eloquent rebuttal of that video, the summary of which is that Italian villagers may have high cholesterol tolerance even without the Milano mutation that white Europeans may be resistant to AIDS but not immune, that having more muscle mass might come at a loss somewhere else, which is to be expected, and most importantly, that the side effects of having unbreakable bones are more severe in pictures than were described in the text. That was pretty significant, I must admit, and it makes sense, too, with the economics of biology. This isn't like the X-Men. You don't get a superpower without having to pay the price. Of course, with severe mutations, there's going to be a trade-off. It's the same sort of give and take we expect of any modification or specialization of pretty much anything. But the vast majority of mutations are subtle and slight, usually causing no more than an increase in variety of physical or chemical proportions in descendant groups, which is how evolution usually works. If any lineage survives severe mutations for many generations, then the fact that we average well over 100 mutations per zygote means that future mutations have an increasing probability to enhance or improve the new condition. These are also cumulative in the descendant genome, such that it is possible to construct or confirm an evolutionary phylogeny by reverse sequencing compiled mutations. This is another way to prove that humans have evolved, that we are much older than the storybooks say, and that our genome is not being degraded the way Ian Juby wants us to believe. He even said that all mutations, even those that lengthen the genome and add receptors to see in more color, should be detrimental or a loss, a loss of information, for which he didn't seem to have an adequate applicable definition despite his claims. According to his own explanations, two existing chromosomes being fused into one count as a loss, a loss of information such that it actually takes less information to create a human than it does any other species of ape. I wonder how he explains that. Apart from his skewed interpretations, false analogies, and unsupported assumptions, he also makes one more valid point which I must honorably concede, uh, albeit with an ounce of redemption. He refers to a very old post of mine on some forgotten blog somewhere which cites an article which does not support any beneficial mutation among Tibetans at high altitude. This is when I realized that my 15-part series on the foundational falsehoods of creationism contained not one, but two false statements of my own which require an apology, and they're both in the same video. This is quite embarrassing for me, too, because either of these could have been corrected in just a couple of minutes had I bothered to double-check the sources. In this case, the mutation named is not from the article I actually read. I meant to cite one of a couple articles included here, which are similar but list different genes or mutations being a naturally selected novel advantage in the Tibetans' adaptation to high altitude, 
as compared to the Han population at lower elevations. The guy I was arguing with online refused to believe that any positive benefit could be attributed to a mutation unless the scientist had pinpointed exactly which gene it was and which type mutation it was. I'm sure he only said that because he thought such things were impossible to determine. So I looked up the relevant keywords again and must have opened a link to what I thought was another abstract of the same research because it was the same scientist running similar tests on the same people at the same time and on the same website. That's where I saw the words glycophorin A somatic cell mutation. I would have had to have read the entirety of that abstract too to realize that this nearly identical study dealt with radiation as opposed to blood oxygen saturation. If I had read it, I would have said, oh wait, it's not that, it's this, and put in the right name and then everything would have been fine. But I didn't check it, and my opponent obviously didn't check it either. No one did. And all the times that I've repasted my half of that conversation in every public forum, every time the same challenge has come up, that's the kicker. That so casual an oversight could go overlooked by so many people for so many years. Creationists always recite more falsehoods in one video criticizing me than I have in my entire video series combined. But pointing out their faults will not absolve me of mine. That's why this is not a debunking video. This is an errata. Unlike apologists, it actually bothers me to feel that I may have uh, misled someone, and I certainly don't do it on purpose. But it doesn't seem to make much difference in this case, because even if I had cited the right papers in which there is nothing wrong with the research, if it proves that there are beneficial mutations, then creationists are compelled to deny it anyway. Now, Ian, I know you said your model works just as well with or without beneficial mutation. But we know that's not true. What you have doesn't qualify as a model, and it doesn't work in any case. Evolution, however, is a model as well as a theory and a fact, all things which creationism isn't. And it actually does work. We know it works because we can see it working. It's measurable, testable, even traceable. We know at least some of the mechanisms involved, and we can show that they are functional. Understanding evolutionary laws and processes contributes enormously to our knowledge of living systems and Earth's history, and it provides a wealth of life-saving advances in agriculture, medicine, and so on. Your notion offers none of that or anything else. It doesn't explain anything, can't be justified, won't align with the data, and fails every test that could be applied to it. Don't kid yourself. All the available evidence from every source anywhere supports, permits, or aligns with evolution unanimously and exclusively. There is no factual evidence against evolution, but if there was, that would not be evidence for creationism, just like it wouldn't be evidence for alien tempering, inherent bioconsciousness, or an illusory matrix construct either. Your preference is not the default. There are other possibilities, and yours is not a possibility by definition, but we'll leave that aside for the moment. Criticize the prevailing theory all you like. Understanding is only improved by correcting errors. But know this. If you could disprove evolution tomorrow, you would still have two major problems. One is that we'd have to conjure a new theory that would look just like evolution in order to account for the volumes of data which only evolution can currently explain, and which creationism can't even acknowledge, much less address. If I ever finish my falsifying phylogeny series, you'll see what I mean. Your other problem is that biblical creationism has already been disproved a long time ago. The only parts not disproved are untestable assertions which are also unsupported. That's why creationism was rejected by the entire global scientific community, especially those in the relevant fields, geology, biology, cosmology. The only exceptions there are the less than 1% of the fringe who admit to a prior religious bias based on faith rather than evidence. And that's another reason not to believe you. Creationists commonly admit and proudly proclaim a philosophy completely opposite science, one which asserts as fact that which is not evidently true, forbids you from admitting when you're wrong, and employs apologetics to rationalize away any and all evidence you can't just ignore. That isn't just unscientific. It's openly dishonest. But that's just one reason why I cannot reject evolution and adopt your belief instead. It isn't just that evolution works and creation fails on all fronts. It isn't just that evolution can be understood with measurable accuracy and substantial benefit in billion-dollar industries while creationism is unintelligible nonsense and dishonest propaganda without any practical application of any kind. It's also that there is simply no reason to believe you, and every reason not to. Because despite your claim, there has never been a single verifiably accurate argument of evidence positively indicative of miraculous creation or any other alternative to natural biological evolution from common ancestry via genetic drift, natural selection, etc. And I welcome your attempt to produce one such example.